Hey folks, Nick Mock 007 here, this time for a much less depressing topic. So dry your eyes and grab a pen and notepad because science is back with an attitude and he's climbing in your window, he's snatching your people up so y'all need to hide your kids, hide your wife and hide your husbands because they... All right, so thanks for all the support for my last series of videos. Uh, those were tough, but I think they can be a valuable resource for folks. But today I wanted to get back to talking about some planet tank specific science and talk about a couple of very important principles. Now, for most folks familiar with Tom Barr, you'll already be one step ahead, but I wanted to take a closer look at plant resource limitation. So there are two theories that most people are familiar with, whether or not you know their names, and these are the Redfield Ratio, also known as Redfield Stoichiometry, and Liebig's Law of the Minimum, but probably more accurately called the Sprengel-Liebig Law of the Minimum. But I wanted to pose a question and hopefully answer it by the end of this video. So Tom Barr is a strong proponent of the Law of the, minim the, law of the Minimum and the associated EI method, but does Tom Barr have it all wrong? So before we get into that, let's start with some definitions. Now the Redfield ratio is the atomic ratio, not the mass, of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, or the CNP ratio, that's found in phytoplankton throughout deep oceans. This empirically developed ratio is found to be 106 to 16 to 1. The term itself is named after the American oceanographer Alfred C. Redfield, who first described this ratio in a paper written in 1934, in which he analyzed nitrate and phosphate data for the Atlantic, Indian, and Pacific Oceans in various seas, uh, as well as data published from other researchers as far back as 1898. Now, in this paper, he found a very interesting phenomenon that across and within the three oceans in the Barents Sea, seawater had an NP ratio, uh, excuse me, atomic ratio near 16 to 1, which was very similar to the average NP ratio in plankton. But what does this mean for all of us? Well, the Redfield ratio was used as a basis for Aquarius to try to limit the growth of algae and provide nutrients to plants. Now, I imagine many of you uh, have heard of the PMDD method of dosing, and this method was actually based off that Redfield ratio notion that we had to supply nutrients in a specific ratio in order to minimize algae and have good plant growth. Now, this led to a lot of folks claiming that phosphate levels in particular needed to be kept low, otherwise you'd end up with massive algae blooms. Enter the law of the minimum, and this is at the heart of Tom Barr's theories. But before I tell you more about that, let's take one step backwards and look at what this law is. So the law of the minimum states that growth is controlled by the scarcest resource or limiting factor. Um, now this law is usually believed to be the result of Eustis von Liebig's research in 1840, but the agronomist and chemist Carl Sprengel published in 1828 uh, an article that contained in essence the law of the minimum. So this concept was originally applied to plant and crop growth, and many times it was criticized, rejected, and then returned to and uh, demonstrated quantitative agreement with experiments in the 1990s. Now, in this graph that I'm going to put up, uh, I have used light as an example, but you could replace light with CO2 or any required nutrient, and the graph would, you know, essentially look the same for expected, excuse me, expected plant growth. Uh, this barrel image that I'll also put up is used uh, now, but uh, should be attributed to Dr. Dobnek um, to demonstrate this principle. So, if you look at it, the water height in the barrel is limited to the lowest stave. Now imagine that each stave is a single nutrient uh, and the water height represents the growth rate of the plant. So the maximum growth rate will be defined by the lowest stave or nutrient. And the growth rate of the plant would follow the one single nutrient in least supply. So in addition to nutrients in a planted tank, you should also consider light and CO2 as potentially limiting factors. Now Tom Barr maintains his tanks based on this law of the minimum, and he's written about it too many times to count. Uh, and this is based on research showing that different species of algae and the 400 plus species of plants we keep uh, actually require different ratios, not just one magic ratio. But even more importantly, that we need not worry about knowing every single ratio out there, but really the main thing is just to prevent strong limitations in any of the necessary nutrients. So let me say, I respect Tom Barr greatly, and he's far smarter than I am, and his tanks are stunning. His plants are perfect if there is such a thing. But let me say, based on some readings, I wonder if the law of the minimum is an accurate explanation. While his results speak for themselves, and I'm not questioning that, what I want to question is the theory or the explanation behind his amazing results. So enter the multiple limitation hypothesis, or MLH, which is based on microeconomic analogies and cost-benefit analysis. 
So let me explain what this theory is and hang in there. You know, if you get confused, I'm going to offer an example here in just a second that I think is going to make it much clearer. According to the MLH, optimum plant adaptive behavior results from balancing resource costs and benefits in such a way that all resources limit plant growth simultaneously, not just a single resource as predicted by the law of the minimum. So this theory proposes that if growth is limited by one resource, a plant should allocate more effort to acquiring the limiting resource and less to acquiring other resources. The resulting shift in the allocation of internal resources enhances the acquisition of the limiting resource, creating a dynamic balance in which all growth is equally limited by all resources. Now, one key assumption of the MLH is that resources can be substituted to a varying degree by each other through a common currency such as carbon. Uh, now, the typical examples of MLH uh, models are terrestrial plant responses to growth constraints imposed uh, by above ground, um, like carbon and light, and below ground resources like nitrogen. So in carbon limited plants, reduced root growth limits nitrogen acquisition. And in nitrogen limited plants, reduced shoot growth limits photosynthetic carbon gain. Under these circumstances, the MLH predicts that carbon limited plants would respond positively to increased nitrogen supply and nitrogen-limited plants would respond positively to increased carbon supply. Now, Liebig's law and the MLH predict markedly different responses to the addition of a single resource. Uh, resource, excuse me. MLH plants should have a positive response to the addition of any individual resource at all levels. Now, take a look at this figure. It's clear that Liebig's law and the MLH cannot both be valid at the same time, and in any specific case, one should prevail over the other. So while MLH fits empirical observations of plant responses to the interactions of carbon, water, and nitrogen limitations. When interactions uh, among diverse nutrient resources are considered, this situation is less clear. So to try to answer that question, I reviewed several research articles, but focused on one by Rubio, Zhu, and Lynch. So see the description below if you're interested in reading it. Um, I'll also list some other papers I recommend, and as always, all my references in preparing this talk. But let's go back to the Rubio, Zhu, and Lynch paper. In their study, they used a plant near and dear to all our hearts, Lemna minor, but you might know it as duckweed. Here's the problem. The results support the general hypothesis that neither uh, Liebig's law nor the multiple limitation hypothesis adequately account for plant responses to all mineral nutrients. In the study, plant responses to some nutrients followed Liebig's law, uh, responses to other nutrients followed the multiple limitation hypothesis, and in some cases, neither paradigm correctly you know, predicted plant response. 23 of the 60 responses analyzed were uh, classified as belonging to Liebig, uh, 20 were classified as um, undefined, and then 17 um, as MLH. Now that's a pretty even three-way split, so doesn't really tell us much. The analysis demonstrated that the regulation of plant effort invested in the capture of essential resources is made on a resource by resource basis instead of a global plant strategy, valid for all nutrients. Therefore, it would not be appropriate to classify a plant as Liebig or MLH because plants can have Liebig and MLH responses at the same time. Now, plant responses to nutrient availability depended on the specific nutrient and on the occurrence and severity of simultaneous constraints to plant growth. In this dual resource experiment, the lack of a uniform pattern of response among nutrients is an indicator of the complexity inherent in physiological responses to nutrient limitations and the difficulty of articulating general simplified models to predict plant responses to nutrient deficits. So this means the law of the minimum, Redfield, MLH, etc., are really all probably oversimplifications and in the situation um, is much more complex in nature where plants are often confronted with multiple nutrient limitations. So of course in our tanks, nutrient availability is typically not much of an issue with the use of any of the uh, common fertilization regimens. Well, and that brings us back to the original question I posed, is Tom Barr wrong? Well, yes and no. While Liebig's law is an oversimplification, it should also be seen as a very, very useful approximation of what's going on. So if Tom Bard doesn't have it exactly right, what should we do about fertilization in the planted tank? Well, I would definitely say stay away from the Redfield ratio, but for the other two theories, as long as you have an adequate supply of nutrients, CO2, and light, then all this controversy will stay away from your tank and be confined to stacks and academic libraries, which is exactly what Tom Barr has been advocating for for over a decade. So maybe I'm a little bit late to the game. 
But pick a solid method like EI or PPS, add light and CO2, and sit back and enjoy your beautiful tank. And if someone asks you how you do it, you could go into an overly complicated explanation like I just gave you in this video, or just nod and say, why, Liebig's Law of the Minimum, of course. <laughs>